And I've had that a lot. And believe me, I'm all about survival. I travel all over the world, and I pray about that a lot. You know, I'm not volunteering to be a martyr, but I may have to be one day. But uh, the, the, we have a survival mentality, but God doesn't want us to live our lives with just a survival mentality. God wants you and me to find out how that we can not just survive, but thrive and actually play a key part right where we are. I don't mean you have to buy a ticket and become a missionary. Right where we are, play a key part in this last day's thing that is happening. And I'm going to talk about how that can be tonight. So I hope that you'll come out because I believe it's going to be something that, that will excite you and, 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 and even change the way you think about some things. Tonight at 6.30. But this morning I want you to open your Bible with me to Psalm 119, longest chapter in the Bible, Psalm 119. I'm going to read one scripture and I hope you have your Bibles and that you're ready to turn in your Bibles because uh, I've got uh, several scriptures I want you to look at with you this morning. And this is a scripture, this, this message this morning is one that I think is foundational to even what I'll share tonight. The most foundational, fundamental thing that I can, here's, here's, here's what it is. It's Sunday morning, July the 2nd. It's Sunday morning. You've come to church. We've already been blessed. We've worshiped. We've had communion. We've communed with the Lord. There's been ministry at this altar already. This is, this is a good day. Hallelujah. But. So my question is, what can I share with you out of the Word of God that will be a help to you? What is the most helpful thing that might help your life I could share with you today? That's what I want to do. I've prayed about this this morning. This morning before I came, I said, Lord, I don't want people to hear from me today. I want them to hear from you. How many of you want a word from God right now? And so, God, what is it that, that you would say to us today that would be the most helpful thing? I don't, uh, some of you I know very well. Some of you, a few hands have never seen me before. And some of you, even though you've seen me before, I still don't know you very well. You're new since I left pastoring years ago. And so, I don't know you in terms of what needs you have. I have no idea, but God does. But what could I share with you today that would pinpoint, that would go right to the point, and that would help Everybody here, and I think this is it, Psalm 119, and the verse I want to read just as an initial text is verse 105, and it says, Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. I want to point out that not everybody here is on the same path. All of us are coming from different directions. No two of us have the same exact problems. I don't have the same problems you do. You don't have the same problems I do. So well, then how can you speak into my life? Because this is amazing. It doesn't matter what path you're on. It doesn't matter what issue is going on in your life. His word is a guide. It's not just a guide. It's the guide. It's, it's a light on the path. It is going to, let me, let me use a different, let me use a different illustration I'm going to talk to you today about how that the Word of God is a compass. And it doesn't matter how far off track your life might be or how close to on track your life is. No matter how far off or how close to on track you are, this Word is a compass that will get you Right on. How many of you know? I, I'm not sure if this works everywhere in the world, but at least where we're at right now, if you're in a, if you're up here in the northern hemisphere, right? If you have a compass, it's going to point north, right? It's gonna, it's gonna point in that direction. You, you could, you, you could get to the North Pole from here. <laughs> uh, this book, it doesn't matter. Some of you say, "Well, I've been saved for 40 years, and I'm walking as close with God as I can, but I've got some issues I don't know what to do about." You're pretty close to the path maybe, but you've got some issues. This is your compass. Somebody else might be say, I'm living way out. I know I'm way away from what God wants me to do. I'm, a, I'm in a mess. My life's in a mess. My finances are in a mess. My marriage is in a mess. My life's in a mess. It doesn't matter how far off. It doesn't matter what. This is the same compass. It still points to true north. And wherever you are starting from, it doesn't matter where you're starting from today. It matters not how far off the path you are. It doesn't make any difference. Wherever it is, this right here is the compass that will get you there. I was talking to my friend from Nigeria that I've been working with for a few weeks now in 
talking about this strategy and teaching about this. And he said something to me. He said, the churches in Nigeria are stuck. I thought that was an interesting. I don't think I've ever heard anybody use that phrase before that I've talked to. He said, the churches in Nigeria are stuck. And what he was saying was, he wasn't saying that God wasn't doing a lot of good things. And in the past, God has done many things in, in Nigeria. But they have come to a place where they have got a certain place and they don't seem to get beyond it. And Nigeria is still uh, probably half Muslim. So in other words, there's areas that are Christian. There's areas that have been evangelized in Nigeria. There's areas where the gospel has made progress. And then it seems like it's got stuck. And he said the, ch the churches in Nigeria are stuck. And he said, that's why I need to hear what you're saying. Teach me what it is you're doing. I want, I, what, would we, what, what would it take to get unstuck? And I got to thinking about that, and I thought, you know, it's not just churches that are stuck. Furthermore, it's not just Nigeria where we're stuck, but all over the world. But not only that, it's not just churches. It's people's lives are stuck. It's people's lives are stuck. It's like, I, Brother David, I'm, I've got this thing. It's stopped me in my tracks. I don't know how to go any further. I'm stopped here. What do I do? Today, the name of this message is called How to Get Unstuck and Back on Track. How many of you would like that? How to Get Unstuck and Back on Track. And the answer is the Word of God. And so I'm going to just tell you right now, this whole message is just based around this. The Word of God in your life is the key to getting unstuck and back on track and back in the perfect will of God in every area of our life. Now then, here's the problem. Somebody would say, well, Brother David, as far as I know, I read the Bible. You know, what's my problem? What, what, well, I'm going to talk about that. What are the things related to the Word of God, to how we handle the Word of God? What are some things that we might be doing that might be uh, making it not have its full power in our life? So that although we read the Bible and come to church and hear the word of God preached, somehow we're still stuck in areas or somehow we're still off track. And there's, there's three or four things I want to just mention to you this morning. The first thing is this, and I want to get you to turn to three scriptures, one after another after another. Turn to Deuteronomy, Old Testament, Deuteronomy, the fifth book, Deuteronomy chapter 4, Deuteronomy chapter 4, and I want to show you something that God is really, really serious about. It's so serious that he says it three times in the Bible. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 2. I want you to be able to see this. Deuteronomy 4, 2. This is what it says. This is God speaking. He says, You must not add anything to what I command you or take anything away from it, so that you may keep the commands of the Lord your God I'm giving you. Now, I want you to hear what God said. I see they got it on the screen. I don't know what translation that is, but it says the same thing. You shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it. That's King James talking right there. What he says is you don't add anything. Everybody say, don't add anything. And don't take away anything from the Word of God. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 12. Turn over a few chapters. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 32. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 32. Look what he says. He says, be careful to do everything I command you. Do not add anything to it. Or take anything away from it. Now he says that twice in Deuteronomy. He says, I'm giving you my word. Do not add anything. And do not take away anything. Now turn to the last chapter of the Bible. A lot of you will be familiar with this one. You know this one's in there. The very last chapter, Revelation chapter 22. I bought a new Bible this week, and some of the pages are still stuck together here. Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 through 19. Now, I know the context here is the, 
is the book of Revelation, but this is the last chapter of the Bible. This is the last inspired, inerrant thing that God gave us is this chapter, chapter 22 of Revelation. So I think it really sums up the whole book, the whole Bible. He says, I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And by the way, the book of Revelation has a lot of plagues in it. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share of the tree of life and the holy city which are written about in this book. I call this problem, we've all gone to school, I call this the math error. A lot of times when people are having problems, they're stuck in their life or they're off track in their life. Related to the Bible, they've made a math error. They've either added something or they've taken away something. And three times in the Word of God, God says, do not add anything. And three times he says, do not take away anything from my Word. No addition, no subtraction from the Word of God. And I find that a lot of us and a lot of Christians have done this. A lot of religious people have done this throughout time. In the days of Jesus, he dealt with two different groups. One were called the Pharisees, and one were called the Sadducees. And the Pharisees added to the word, and the Sadducees subtracted from it. It's interesting to me that the Sadducees are actually worse than the Pharisees. They worked together, but it was the Sadducees who ran the Sanhedrin. It was the Sadducees that condemned Jesus, found him guilty, and put him on the cross. It was, one, it was one political party that, that ran the show. It was the, in fact, the people in the Sanhedrin uh, that spoke in his favor, like Nicodemus, were Pharisees. Uh, we always put down the Pharisees. The problem of the Pharisees was not that they didn't believe the whole Bible. My dad used to tell the story of this woman that was giving her testimony in court. And they said to her, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? And she said, yes, sir, I do, and a whole lot more besides. That was... That's what the Pharisees did. They said, oh, we believe all the Bible, plus, let me tell you. And what they did was, are you listening to what I'm telling you this morning? They added their interpretations and made their interpretations equal with the Bible. They actually did a thing that they called fencing it in. They said, they said look, the, we, we, we don't want to, we, we want to keep the word of God. We want to do what it says and just to make sure that we don't violate it anywhere, we, we're going to build a fence and we're going to add some regulations. Because if, if, if we can build this fence out here, then, uh, then we won't at all break any of the commandments. But what happened? What were they doing? God, how many of you know, they, that, they, I, I'm going to just give a benefit of the doubt to the Pharisees and say, you know what, I think they meant well. Just like a lot of evangelical Christians mean well. I think they meant well, but unfortunately, we're not smart enough to toy with the Word of God. We're not qualified to do that. And because our own motives start messing up, and, they, 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 and Jesus said, do you remember one time Jesus said, you have made the Word of God of no effect because of what? Your traditions. When you see the word tradition, just understand Tradition means addition. Tradition means addition. Their traditions had added to what God's word actually said. And so they were making it of none effect. A lot of times people say, Brother David, it's amazing to me that people are, are coming to Christ so much and we hear miracles and we hear this and we hear that. Why don't we have it over here? We have so much of the gospel. We have, why don't we see over here? What we, well, sometimes, we, of course, we do see it over here. But here's the point. I think that one thing that we tend to do a lot of times, and especially those of us that are conservative evangelicals, those of us that are truly born-again people, the error we tend to make is adding to the Bible. So can you give me an example? Sure, I can give you an example. Uh, an example like this. Uh, and, and I can use this example here because I'm looking around and, and this church has, and a lot of churches have, but this church has really uh, clearly not 
knocked this tradition out the window. There is no dress code to come to church. Hallelujah. That's true. Now, in former years, how many of you know there used to be a dress code? I don't mean a formal dress code. There's nothing wrong with coming dressed up in a suit. There's nothing wrong with that. I actually thought about coming dressed in a suit just so I could prove that I wasn't against that. And then I decided I'd be, you know, more comfortable like this today. Here's the point. There is no dress code for church in the Bible. There is a dress code in the Bible. It's the same for church as it is for Walmart. Listen, sweetheart, if you're running naked down to Walmart... If you're showing us everything that you're proud of, but we don't want to see it, the Bible actually does have something to say about that. The Bible does not give us a church dress code. It tells us to be decent. So it doesn't mean be decent when we come to church to worship God. It means be decent every time we're out among other human beings. Wow. Wow. Making it a church dress code and putting legalistic standards on that is addition to the word of God. See, God says we don't, we need to take, i never forget it, I think it was one of our missionaries, I think it was Sid Luke, but I'm not sure, that in the front of his Bible had written these words, use at full strength, do not dilute. And we have tended to add things. Here's the problem. Like I said, I believe that people that add to Scripture actually are well-intentioned. In fact, I think we preachers have, are, are probably the most guilty of it of anybody. Uh, but this is something that, that grips me now every time I stand in front of people is that, David, make sure you're not adding to the Word of God. That when it's done, when people have heard you, they don't walk out with a new conviction that you've given them, but which God has not given them. With, a, with some law or something that I'm putting, that we've not, because here's what happens. No matter how well-intentioned it is, it makes of none effect the word of God. God's word is what he affirms. And so, by the way, we'll get to talking about that. That means we need to find out what God's word actually says. We'll say about that. What about the taking away? We're living now. It's not, thank God, uh, for the faithfulness of your pastor to preach the word of God. It's not happening here. But in many churches in our world today, I believe I'm seeing evidence of people taking away for the, from the word of God, even in evangelical churches. Taking away from the word of God means, uh, well, I know the Bible says this practice is wrong, but... You know, God knows my heart, so I'm just going to go ahead and engage in this. See, we live in a time right now where people serve God as long as they can strain his word in such a way that it legitimizes what they're already doing. And here's the problem with that. Let me tell you the problem. It is worse to take away from his word. It's bad to do both. He commands us, do not add or take away. The problem with taking away from God's word, the problem with taking God's word and literally straining it so that there's parts of it that we say, you know what, I know, I think God's word says that, but that was just back in the first century. That was just back in Bible days. That was, I don't, we, this is, you know, this is 2017. This is modern day America. We got to, the problem with, with taking away from God's word is this. Now listen to what the guy said, uh, the writer said in Revelation 22. What did he say? He said, if you add to the word, it will be added to you the plagues. Now, if you read the book of Revelation, what you find out is the plagues were things that happened here in this life. I'm going to tell you, if you add to God's word, you will blunt the power of God in your life here in this world. It will open the door to the enemy slamming you. It will open the door to plagues in your life. Adding to the word of God makes the word of God of none effect, Jesus said. It takes the effect of the word of God, which should be blessing your life and advancing the kingdom of God, and it blunts it. 
So don't add to the word of God because that leads to consequences here in this life. But what did he say about taking away from the word of God? He said, your place out of the city, your place from the tree of life is taken away. That's eternal consequences. And so understand that God says, don't make the mathematics error when it comes to the word of God. If you want to treat this as what it really is, God's holy word, this is the answer for your life. This is the light and it is the compass that will get you on track no matter where you're at right now. But, this, but you must not add to it. Or you must not take away from it. Absolutely. By the way, you are capable of reading and understanding this and knowing what that means in your life. I hate to tell you, when I was a pastor, I've had counseling sessions where people sat across me in my office and asked me for permission to disobey this. That didn't just happen one time. I have said as a pastor in counseling sessions where people came in and said, this is what I'm doing, this is what I want to do, this is what I've decided to do, but this scripture over here says this, explain it to me. And what they wanted me to do was explain to them how what they were doing was okay. Neither myself nor any other preacher has the authority to do that for you. you we, will, we will stand before God one day. The word of God has been made available to you and to me. And when we stand before God, we will be held accountable for what we have done with his word. And we won't be able to say, well, I heard my favorite preacher on television say that, but it was okay. Or I read this book over here. Listen, God has given his word. God has given his word. When, when the rich man was in hell, you remember this? And he says... You know, give me a little water. And Abraham says, can't get over to you there, bud. Sorry. He says, well, I'll tell you what. Send Lazarus back from the dead and warn my brothers. And what did Abraham say to the rich man? They have Moses and the prophet. In other words, they have the word of God. If they will not heed the word of God, they will not heed the one is sent back from the dead to them. By the grace of God, we've been given the word of God. We must heed it. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. Well, then what should we do relative to it? Well, we don't want to make the math error. We don't want to make the reading error. We're still in school. We don't want to make the reading error. Turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 22. In Matthew chapter 22, it was the Sadducees, those guys that were taking away from the, from the, uh, uh, from the word of God. One of the things the Sadducees did was they denied the resurrection. They didn't believe there was life after death or resurrection. And uh, so they come to Jesus and they tell him, some cockamamie story that they've made up. Oh, uh, there was this guy, and he married this one woman, and then she died. Oh, no, no, wait, excuse me. Let me get it right. She married this man, and then he died. And then uh, she married his brother, and he died. And then she married his third bro next brother, and he died. And then she married the next brother, and he died. And then she married the fifth brother, and he died. And then she married the sixth brother, and he died. And then she married the seventh brother, and he died. No, just on a side note, I would not marry that woman. She <laughs> is doing something. I don't know what it is. But I want to say to that seventh guy, listen to me, idiot. <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> But they, they tell this story, and then they say, then they say, and whose wife will she be in the resurrection? And so they're just, you know, see, if there's a resurrection, whose wife would she be? You know, we've got you stumped, you know. And, of course, Jesus answers them, and he, he explains to them the thing. There's, marriage does not continue over into eternal life, into heaven or into the, into the resurrection. And, and uh, we don't understand those things. Uh, I, I think that means if you still like your wife up there, you can't, I don't think it means you can't hang around her or something, you know. But uh, uh, it's not the same relationship is what Jesus is saying. But here's what, here's what Jesus says to them in verse uh, 29. Matthew 22, verse 29. Jesus answered them, 
you are mistaken because you don't know the scriptures or the power of God. You are mistaken because you don't know the scriptures. The second big problem with us is this. A lot of people, even in the church, don't know the scriptures. And the reason they don't know them is they're not reading the word of God. I, I, and, 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 and I, and I want to say this. It's not just that we don't know the scriptures. Friends, I think what's happening is that a lot of us, it's like we don't know what it is we've got here. If you've got a Bible in your hand right now, these 66 books, 39 of an old covenant and 27 of the new covenant that is ratified in the blood of Jesus that we celebrated through this communion, that new covenant is yours today in total effect right now. And if you don't know this, you don't know what you've got. Often people are violating God's word because they don't know what God's word says. They don't know it. And they don't, many people don't know what they've got. They don't know that, that what they have, if you have a Bible there, just, just hold it in your hand. I don't mean hold it up, but just hold it in your hand and look at this. What you have there is the most supernatural thing you will ever hold in your natural hand. You're holding a physical thing, a Bible. You're holding a book but it is the most supernatural thing you'll ever hold in your life. Many, many years ago, my friends, one of the things that has held me through all the nonsense that we listen to in the media uh, and, and listen to in, in, on television, we listen to and all the new things, well, we've discovered this and we've discovered there's all kinds of doubt that is constantly being heaped on this book, whether or not it's true, questions raised about it. This book, believe me, it can withstand the questions. We're not afraid of anybody's questions. But here's the point that I'm making. With all of this, a lot of people don't realize anymore what this is. But let me tell you an experience that happened in my life in the 1970s growing up in this church. And one day, years ago, back in the mid-1970s, we had a guest speaker named Norval Hayes here at this church. Some of you know who Norval Hayes is. And he's still kicking after all these years. And he was over there in that A-frame building where we where had the auditorium in those days. And I was just a kid. This would have been, I would have been about 12 years old or so. And I was getting ready to spend the night. We, we were having a Norval Hayes revival. I was getting ready to spend the night with uh, one of my buddies in the, in the church there. So I was sitting back there near the back. There was two rows. And I was sitting near the back on this side, like not the very last row, but toward the back, me and my buddy, and when service was over, and if you know Norval Hayes, you know the service is going to go a long time, And but when it was over, I was going to go home with him, we were going to spend the night, and I was going to spend the day with him, have fun the next day and all this, and we're sitting back there. What I didn't know was that across the aisle, somebody had brought a person, a lost person in that night, a person from Louisiana, a person that was a full-fledged practicing witch. A person who was lost and did not know God and was into witchcraft, and that person had been brought by her brother into the church who was a Christian from up around Evansville or Corridon or Henderson up that area and had brought that person into the church. And, that, and when the power of God was moving in the service, that lady that was a witch started getting nervous. Those demons in her started getting nervous and started just doing like this. And, 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 and somebody came up to the front and Brother Norval was busy praying for somebody, and they came up to the front, and they said to my dad, they said, Brother Parrish, there's a lady back here that needs prayer. That's, what you, that's all the information you want to give somebody when it's like that. Just tell them they need prayer. <laughs> and so my dad just had his Bible in his hand, and he just started walking toward the back, toward her. And when he got about as close to her, as I am to Joe Wallace right there, I'm sitting over here, me and my buddy just talking. You know, the worship service is going on, we're talking. She let out the most piercing scream I have ever heard in my life. I nearly jumped five feet. We, me and my friend just about passed away. And 
Dad got about this close to her, and, and what happened was they came, they ministered to her, they cast those demons out of her. She got completely set free. She got saved. The next day, she got filled with the Holy Ghost. She was the secretary to the governor of Louisiana, and she went back to Louisiana and won his daughter to the Lord. And it changed her life, and it was a miracle of God. Later on, she was asked, you know, when that guy was walking towards you, when you screamed, what was going on? What were you experiencing? She said, I didn't even see that guy. She saw, but he had a big, he had this book in his hand. And she said, those spirits in me, the closer that book got to me, the more terrified they were. All they could see was this book. And when I was in college later on, many years later, and was studying various forms of biblical criticism, no matter what I read or studied, I never could figure out why an uninspired book would scare a demon. I've got news for you. The critics can say anything they want. This is the word of Almighty God. It was breathed by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit breathed into it, and if you'll open it, the Holy Spirit will breathe out of it onto you. This word makes devils tremble. It will set the captive free, and it will get your life back on course. You must not treat this like just some other book. This is not just some other book. This is the one, the only, the inspired, the infallible, the inerrant word of Almighty God. That's what this is. Consequently, the key, the absolute key in, in your life and in my life and in getting on course is this word. And we've got to know what it is we've got in our hands. And we've got to know it. That means read it. That means hear it. That means come to understand it. Bring it into your life. Now, some people do that part, but I want you to turn to another scripture. Just two more scriptures today, and I'll close. Joshua chapter 1. In Joshua chapter 1, we can't add to it. We can't take away from it. We must read it. Like said, Luke had written in his Bible, use at full strength. Take it in. Understand it. Now, there's all kinds of things in this book. There is an old covenant, and we have to understand how that relates to the new covenant. We understand these things, but I'm telling you, we must take it in. We must learn it. This has got to be, let me put it this way, this book has got to become the absolute authority in our lives. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. Allow the word of God to correct you. Allow the word of God. Allow God. Don't say to God, God, I don't think it's fair because I want to do this or this is the way I think I am and this is the, my tendency and I don't see uh, why because how can your word say this is wrong if I feel like... Put that aside and realize that if you will come to God and humbly submit to him and his word, he will by his spirit do whatever transforming power he needs to in your life. And it will set you free. But see, there's the, there's the math error. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. There's the reading error. People just aren't even reading it. But put it, bottom line, let's do it this way. The, the, the fundamental, the worst error of all and the most common error even among people that believe this is the word of God, is this. It's what I call the obedience issue, where we know what it says, but we still choose to do what we want to do. And that also takes and unplugs the power of the word of God out of your life. Joshua was told by God in Joshua 1.8, this book of the law or this book of instruction must not depart from your mouth. You are to meditate on it day and night so that you may carefully observe everything written in it. For then you will prosper and succeed in whatever you do. This book of the law will not, shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night that you may observe to do, that you may ob obey that you may obey whatever is written in it. And here's what we've discovered. 
And somebody said, what is the key if there was one fundamental, there's so many keys to what is happening in Honduras and what is happening in disciple-making movements around the world. Prayer is a key. Yes, there's so many keys. But if somebody said, well, what is the real number one fundamental difference between what you guys are doing down there and what we're doing up here in America? What is the difference? The difference is in Honduras and in disciple-making movements, we are using a strategy called obedience-based discipleship. And it means from the first, it's not that we change, no, we preach the gospel and we're not saved by works, we're saved by grace, period. Understand that. But as we disciple people, we are discipling. The one thing we're teaching people is this is the word of God. Every week we're going to sit down in our groups and see what God said. We're not going to add. We tell our people, you don't teach anything. You read the word of God and say, what does it mean? That's all we do. You teach what the word of God says. You learn what God is saying. And every week we end it with, what are you going to do about it? And the next week when we come back, the first question is, what did you do about it? And that starts from week one when the group is nothing but a bunch of lost people. And we disciple them to obey God and his word. We say, we're not the authority. God's word is the authority. And that is what is multiplying. And that's why 17 people a day are being saved and baptized. Because of obedience. But here in the, in the West and what we tend to do is we hear and we hear and we hear and we hear and we obey what part we want to obey. And we've unplugged the power of God in our lives through disobedience. And I'm not preaching at you. Guess what? I'm an American Christian myself. I've unplugged a lot of it in my life before too. And here's the point. Do we want the power of God or not? Do we want to get unstuck? Unstuck is simple. It's not that complicated. Back on track is simple. It's not that complicated. It's as simple as this. It's as simple as saying, today or tomorrow morning, I'm starting fresh. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to add anything, Lord. I promise you, today when I read your word, I'm not going to add anything to it. I'm not going to take away from it. I'm going to read it. I'm going to hear what you say. And today, I'm going to make a step of obedience to what you absolutely told me in that book. I'm gonna, I believe it, I'm going to meditate on it, and I'm going to step out and obey it. That is the key. That's the key. That's the fundamental. When you boil it all down, that's the only thing that we're doing differently in the DMM uh, strategy uh, is, is, is emphasizing you hear what God said. Somebody comes to us and they say, well, what do you think I ought to do about such and such? In the past, I used to say, well, here's the answer I'll give you. Now I don't give that answer. I just open the Bible. I say, read it. When they read it, I say, what did it say? They tell me. I say, what are you going to do about it? That's the end of counseling right there. I am not a psychologist. God's word either is heard, understood, and obeyed, or it's not. It's as simple as that. If you want back on track, take in this book and obey it. It is absolutely the key. And let me tell you this. Somebody says, that seems so hard. No, it's not. You know, the Bible says that his commands are not grievous. The Bible tells us that what, everything that he tells us in this book is for our good. I've got news for you. God loves you. Loves you. He, God not only loves God adores you. You are the apple of his eye. He doesn't have anything bad to dish out to you. Bad things may have happened to you, but it didn't come from God. God loves you, and his instructions are for you. They may not be what you want to hear, but they are what you need, and they are only for your good, 100%. So hear it and obey it. I tell this story as I start to uh, uh, circle the airport to land this plane this morning. Turn over in your Bible to Luke chapter 24, will you, as, we're, as I'm going to be sharing with you. Luke chapter 24, the last scripture I'm going to read, the last chapter of the book of Luke. Luke chapter 24. Years ago when I was in the fifth grade, I went to Brinesburg Elementary School. Uh, it's not a school anymore. It's an apartment complex over here. And, uh, but that's where I went to school, from the third to the, to the sixth grade, before I went to North Marshall. And uh, when I was in the fifth grade, 
our teacher did an experiment with our fifth grade class. You can imagine that I was a student in a class that was experimented on, can't you? <laughs> this is the experiment she did. She came in one day and she took, had a piece of paper. And she handed everybody, every student in the class, this piece of paper. It was writing on it. She said, listen to me carefully. I want you all, when I say go, I want you to read this paper. Don't do anything else. Read the whole paper. Once you have read the whole paper, do exactly what it told you to do. Begin. So I began to read. And the first line on the paper said, do nothing until you have read the whole paper. I read that. The next line. I don't remember everything, but there was about 10 or 15 or 20 lines. And they were things like, pat your belly, rub your head, grin, stick out your tongue, flap a wing, put one foot out like this, flap both wings, say yes out loud. I mean, it's just a list like that. At the bottom of the page, it says, now that you have read the whole page, do nothing. Sign your name at the top and turn the page over on your desk. I was a very good student. I read that and I realized this is a test of can we follow directions. And so I signed my name on the top of the page and turned it over and I looked around. And everybody in the room was, yes, mm, 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 mm. They, were, they were going through these things. And I'm looking at them, and they're all doing these things. Every, I'm telling you that every other student in that class except me was doing all of the instructions. None of them had read it all the way through. They were all just going through and doing all the things. And I looked at them, and I looked at them, and I, you know what I did? I panicked, and I thought I couldn't have understood. I turned it over, and what did I start doing? Instead of obeying what was written, I started flapping and kicking with the best of them. And when it was over, the teacher just shook her head, and she said, none of you followed instruction. And then I was so mad. I understood it. I understood it. Folks, this is what we're doing in the body of Christ many times. We're looking around to see what other people are doing. We're even looking around to seeing what other Christians are doing. And we're saying, well, it must be all right because so-and-so's doing it. These people over here, they're doing it, so it must be all right. We read something in the Word of God, and God, through His Word, speaks to us, and we see what He is saying, and we understand what He wants in our lives. We can hear from God. We can read and understand His Word. He, we know what He's saying, and we hear what He says, and then we say, yeah, but it can't be, it, that can't be that important because, look over here. What do you do about that? How do you do it? And I'm not saying we can't see examples and that we can set examples for people and so forth. But friend, again, we must take our eyes off other people. We must take our eyes off what everybody says is acceptable or unacceptable. And we must be fully convinced in our own heart and mind based on the word of God, plus and minus nothing, what does his word say? Because that's what God's going to hold us accountable for. That's the thing that's going to bring blessing into our life now and forever. It's what does God say? Will we hear it? Will we understand it? And will we radically obey it? Will we radically obey it? Will we absolutely do what he said no matter what? Now, sometimes people say, well, Brother David, I don't trust, though, that I really understand the Word of God. First of all, let me tell you something. I want to put your mind at ease, first of all, that you really can read and understand yourself what God's Word is. Yeah, there's things in the Bible that I don't understand. I don't know what the second toe on the fourth beast is. There may be some things in Bible prophecy. There may be some, some, some places in Scripture that are difficult to grasp. I understand that. But friends, you know as well as I do that you can read. There are, the scripture is pretty much plain 
on, on the point that it's making. You can understand it. Why in the world would God, it, it, it doesn't even make sense that God gives us his word in such a way that it's incomprehensible to us. It doesn't even make sense. So the word of God, there's even a doctrine called the perspicuity of the Bible. It's a true doctrine and it means it's understandable. It's a truth. God's word can be understood and you can understand. But beyond that, if you're a follower of Jesus, God has sent the Holy Spirit into your life. The Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you. And hear me now, the Holy Spirit, the true Holy Spirit will never tell you something that goes contrary to his written word. There is no division between the word and the spirit. There is none. The, the word and the spirit agree. And listen to this in, Revel, uh, in Luke chapter 24, my last scripture. Jesus had risen from the dead and he had appeared to the disciples, the 11 surviving disciples. And verse 44, he said to them, Luke 24, 44, he told them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms, that was the scriptures that they had in those days, must be fulfilled. Listen to verse 45. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Wow. Now, this is the same visit where Jesus met with his disciples on the day of the resurrection that is told to us at the, in John chapter 20. And in John chapter 20, he says that he breathed on them and said, what did he say? Receive the Holy Ghost. Now, in Luke's account, it doesn't say he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Ghost. It says he opened their minds that they might uh, comprehend or understand the scriptures. I can put those two together because they happen simultaneously. One's recorded in Luke and one's recorded in John. And I can tell you that the Holy Spirit on the end, by the way, that was their new birth. Because when they got baptized, the Holy Spirit was uh, 50 days later on the day of Pentecost the empowering, but this was when the Holy Spirit came into them to indwell them. So every Christian has the Holy Spirit living on the inside of them at the new birth. Your body's the temple of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you. And one of the things the Holy Spirit does to the children of God is he enables you to understand his word. He doesn't give you things to add to the word. He's already told us not to do that but he gives you the comprehension. What he gives you additionally is the understanding of the word of God. So the Holy Spirit on the inside of you will give you enlightenment to what God's word means. And remember this, it's not just so that we'll be educated. It's not just so that we'll know it, but so that we'll obey it. The Holy Spirit on the inside of you will lead you and guide you and open your mind to understand. So here's what I want to say to you today. If you say today, Brother David, I'm not sure if I could really, if I could really trust. You're like I was in that fifth grade class. Even though I did comprehend what it said, I didn't trust. And so I ended up looking around at what everybody else was doing. I want you to know, stop looking around and start looking in the word of God and asking the Holy Spirit to give you understanding and be committed to radically step out and do it, what God says. And here's what I promise you. If you'll begin that, I'm not talking about just doing that on Monday and then no more. If you'll do this as a lifestyle, if you will begin to approach this book as what it is, the very word of God, and begin to ask the Holy Spirit to give you insight, and when you read it, say, God, I'm not going to add to it. I'm not going to take away from it. I'm going to ask you this question. What is this telling me to do today? And you do that on Monday, and you do that on Tuesday, and you do that on Wednesday, and you do that on Thursday, and you do that on Friday, and you do that on Saturday, and you do that on Sunday, and guess what? You do that the second week, and the third week, and the fourth 
fourth week and the tenth week and the hundredth week. You do that the first year and the second year. I'm going to tell you something, my friend. You can stop worrying about being out of the will of God. You, regardless of where you are starting today, that compass will put you in the center of the will of God for your life. You will be pleasing God. You will be changing the world. You will be changing the world that you live in. Hallelujah. You'll be unstuck and you'll be back on track. How many of you want to be that? Hallelujah. Give Jesus praise right now. Thank you, Lord. Stand to your feet with me, please. If our musicians want to play something as we're closing out this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You people, those of you that have never heard me before, you don't realize it, but it's only 12 minutes till 12 and you've seen a miracle. I told Scott, <laughs> I told Scott, I didn't realize it. I preached at a church last Sunday and the, the pastor wasn't there, you know, so I just let loose, you know, and, and uh, I got a CD when it was done. I didn't preach the same message uh, and uh, I listened to it. I preached 79 minutes, an hour and 19 minutes. So you people have been blessed from on high today. Hallelujah. But you know what? It's not about what I say. It's about what God says. And what God says. The only authority up here right now is this right here. And I commend this to you. And what I want to do is just, let's just bow our heads for just a moment. And I'm going to lead a prayer, not because there's anything magic in a prayer, in this prayer, or in repeating this. But I'm going to lead a prayer that you can say that will help you make a commitment in a fresh way toward this. And uh, I just ask you to pray this out loud with me. Say, Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord, that Jesus went to the cross to bear my sins. I believe that Jesus died for me, that he rose from the dead. And I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and I proclaim him as the Lord of my life Lord I want to put your word in first place in my life I want to obey Jesus by obeying the word of God Holy Spirit open my heart open my mind to understand your word more every day I make a commitment to pick it up, to read it, to hear what you say. Lord, I make a commitment to obey your word. This week, let this be a compass in my life. I want to be unstuck. I want to be back on track. I want to fulfill my purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give him praise right now. Thank you, Lord. Praise your name. Praise your name. Brother Scott told me when I was done, I can dismiss. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to dismiss you in just a moment, but I'm going to be standing here. And there may be other uh, leaders here that will join me. And anybody that says, Brother David, there's a need that I, I need prayer for. Some people were already ministered to at the altar earlier, but maybe you didn't. One of the things the Bible says, this is in the Bible. If you're sick, call for the elders. Let them pray for you. Let them anoint you with oil. That's simple obedience. So we'll do that. We can't heal, but we can pray. And God's the healer. And whatever we do, whether we're praying for healing or something else, where two or three agree on anything, God says to us. So if you need agreement in prayer or prayer for healing or something, you come. As these people uh, play and just lead us in worship just a little bit. And otherwise, we dismiss you. Tonight at 630, we're going to move into the Word of God in another area. God bless you. It's good to be with you today. Come and let us pray for you.